ladies and gentlemen a warm good morning to all of you i am delighted uh, to be here today this morning let me at the outset uh, compliment uh, the college of supervisors for uh, taking this initiative in organizing this uh, conference which is from now on going to be an annual feature in the calendar of uh, the college of supervisors and in the calendar of the reserve bank of india in the calendar of our entire uh, financial uh, system in particular i must mention the way mr vishwanathan described the you know the analogy between uh, two important things he said which become very relevant uh, today one is the analogy with uh, the cricket in this ipl season of t20 the surprise or the risk can come from any source any from anywhere any time when everybody is adopting unconventional styles whether it's the bowler or the batsman or the fielder i think that calls for greater uh, alertness greater uh, uh, you know greater alertness and greater uh, sense of uh, urgency on the part of every participant in the game and in the financial sector the second thing he mentioned was about uh, border you know on touched upon communication that is uh, you know he narrated this uh, incident about this uh, samast sarkari bank i recall recently when sv bank uh, collapsed in us one of our cooperative banks which had a similar name had to issue immediately a press statement and i think a social media statement uh, that is i think svc you all know they had to issue a social media statement a cooperative bank here in mumbai that it's not us it is somebody else in the united states social media you know the news can transmit can transform uh, can tra you know can uh, sort of move very fast as i said i'm extremely happy to be here among researchers and practitioners to participate in this uh, global conference on financial resilience organized by the college of supervisors i would like to convey my appreciations to the college of supervisors for organizing this event i would also like to convey my appreciations to the college of supervisors for the progress it has made for its accomplishments since it started functioning in january 2021 we faced many challenges in the financial sector and i recall in 2019 we were dealing with a you know a liquidity challenge in the non banking financial company sector when we were monitoring it very intensively at the rbi all of you many of you would be aware then 2020 the covid struck us somewhere along this process we thought of uh, i mean we realized the greater importance of skill building capacity building for supervisors within rbi and also in the financial sector so in that that background we decided to set up this college of supervisors and i am very happy to note that it has come up and is coming up very well and we have lot of expectations from these uh, college of supervisors and i am sure they will be able to live up to the expectations of the reserve bank as well as the expectations of our financial sector in the context of the overall impact of covid-19 pandemic the war in ukraine and the recent banking sector crisis in the united states and europe on the financial sector there is now renewed focus on issues of financial resilience and stability regulators and governments across the world are now looking at these aspects with greater intensity adequacy of the existing regulations and supervisory systems are under a fresh assessment in this background a global conference on financial resilience is very appropriate and timely the financial sector in a country and the individual entities therein that is in the financial sector like banks non banking financial companies that is nbfcs and other entities have to be resilient at all times they should have the inner strength to withstand even the most stressful times so far as india is concerned the reserve bank of india has significantly strengthened its supervision and regulations of banks and other regulated entities in the recent years our approach has been to enhance the resilience as well as the robustness of the financial sector 
so that individual entities effectively withstand stressful situations and continue to contribute to the process of economic development of the country. <clears throat> In my address today, I propose to highlight the expectations of the Reserve Bank of India from stakeholders in the Indian financial system or for that matter stakeholders in any financial system. In most economies, central banks act as the custodians of financial stability. Central banks are also empowered to act as lender of the last resort during financial crisis. This historical function of providing emergency liquidity assistance to banks and other financial market institutions necessitates that central banks keep a close watch on banks and financial markets for signs of instability, if any. Moreover, monetary policy is implemented largely through banks and financial markets. The transmission of monetary policy to the real economy depends very crucially on a smooth functioning of the financial markets as well as uh, financial markets as well as financial intermediaries like banks and NBFCs. It is in this context that the key and complementary functions of the central bank such as setting of interest rates, liquidity management, regulation and supervision regulation and supervision over the banking and other segments of the financial sector, they have become even more pronounced. These functions work together to support economic growth by maintaining financial stability and promoting responsible behavior among financial institutions. Let me now specifically turn to the concept of resilience, which is the theme of today's conference. Systemic resilience depends both on the resilience of individual financial institutions as well as on the interdependencies among them. A resilient, future-ready bank needs to be financially, operationally, and organizationally resilient. To be financially resilient, a bank should have adequate capital buffers and be ready to generate earnings even in times of severe macroeconomic shocks. It should also have adequate liquidity to meet its obligations in various situations. Therefore, financial resilience is closely linked to a bank's business model and strategy. The Reserve Bank has therefore started looking at the business models of banks more closely. Aspects or deficiencies in the business model itself can spark a crisis in due course. We have not only prescribed regulatory norms for capital adequacy and liquidity ratios, but even gone beyond to nudge the banks to build up capital buffers in good times and times of plenty. As you may recall, we did this during the COVID-19 pandemic times when there was plenty of liquidity in the system, when the interest rates were low, and when the full impact of the pandemic on the financial sector was still highly uncertain. Now, talking about the business model, I think the recent developments in uh, United States uh, in particular, there is again questions about whether the business model of individual banks that have faced challenges, that have faced difficulties, whether their business models were right. There are questions being asked all around, but I am not uh, going into that. Because these, you know, these uh, business models uh, sometimes can sort of create risks in certain parts of the balance sheet of a bank, which going forward can blow up into a bigger crisis. So therefore, we are focusing now on uh, the business models adopted by, very, by the banks, and I will touch upon it a little later in uh, uh, more detail. The Reserve Bank has put in place various prudential regulatory frameworks. These include, as is well known, capital adequacy requirements, asset classification, provisioning requirements, even dividend distribution and liquidity management framework, etc. In addition, the Reserve Bank also periodically deploys macroprudential measures to address system level buildup of risks. 
as a consequence of the measures taken by the Reserve Bank and the banks themselves, I must mention here, the Indian banking system has remained resilient and has not been affected adversely by the, by the recent sparks of financial instability seen in some advanced economies. This also comes out clearly in our recent stress test results. The gross NPA ratio, that is the gross non-performing asset ratio for the scheduled commercial banks in India was 4.41% at the end of December 2022, down from 5.8% on March 31st, 2022, and 7.3% as on March 31st, 2021. The CRAR at 16.1% at the end of December 22 is also much above the minimum regulatory requirement. Macro stress tests for credit risk indicate that scheduled commercial banks would be able to comply with the minimum capital requirements even under severe stress situations. Nevertheless, recent events in the banking landscape of the United States and Europe suggest that risks for an individual bank could crop up from segments of its balance sheet which might have been considered relatively safer. Hence, we expect the management and board of directors of each bank to continually assess the financial risks and focus on building up adequate capital and liquidity buffers even beyond the minimum regulatory requirements. And this is required for continued resilience and sustainable growth of individual banks and financial entities. Now turning to operational resilience, let me say that uh, operational resilience would mean that a bank should be able to deliver critical services even in face of disruptions. Cyber risks and possible cyber attacks are on top of the list so far as such disruptions are concerned. Cyber risk has been identified as the foremost in top 10 operational risks for 2023 based on a global survey of financial institutions. The Bank for International Settlements, that is BIS, with, while revising the principles for sound management of operational risks in 2021, introduced introduced a specific principle on information and communications technology, that is ITC risk management, reflecting the importance of this risk. Robust IT and information security governance would help in increased predictability and reduction of uncertainty in operations, minimize losses from information security related incidents and enhance operational resilience. Given the extensive level of outsourcing being done by the banks and by other financial entities, there is even greater need for ensuring that effective policies and practices are put in place in this regard. Even the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors are focusing on risks arising from third party dependencies. The Reserve Bank has taken a slew of measures in recent years with usage of advanced analytical and surveillance tools, along with techniques like phishing simulation and cyber reconnaissance exercises to push for enhanced IT and cybersecurity governance processes in banks as well as in other supervised entities. In the context of growing exposure of our regulated entities to various risks from dependencies on third, party, third parties which provide technology and IT enabled services. The Reserve Bank has recently, that is on 10th April this year, about, uh, you know, just about uh, 20 days ago, uh, the Reserve Bank has on 10th April issued comprehensive guidelines on information technology outsourcing by banks, NBFCs, and other regulated entities. Now, the third component of resilience, I mentioned about financial resilience, organizational resilience. The third component of resilience for banks and others is to, uh, so, sorry, I, I think I mentioned about uh, financial resilience, operational resilience, and the third component is organizational resilience. So let me now focus on organizational resilience in brief. Uh, 
banks and other financial institutions also need to be organizationally resilient so that they anticipate risks early and absorb them efficiently. Organizations must have the capacity and resilience to protect themselves from adverse incidents and shield their balance sheets. To achieve organizational resilience, regulated entities need to continuously evolve by standardizing policies, processes, organizational culture, and governance. They must also be flexible enough to encourage diverse ideas and innovations within the organization. You see, there is one thing. The institution by itself should have the inherent organizational resilience to withstand crisis. And uh, uh, I, I elaborate upon it a little more as we, I mean, I elaborate it, uh, I will, you know, dwell uh, in greater detail on this as we go forward. Now, let me just also in this context touch upon the pillars of Reserve Bank's regulatory and supervisory strategy. An important element of our strategy of making the Indian financial system, including the banking system, future ready is to, uh, future ready is the robust and enhanced regulatory and supervisory framework which we have put in place. Our present approach to regulation and supervision has been built essentially on three pillars. First, one of our focus areas in recent years has been to strengthen governance and assurance functions within the regulated entities. The safety and soundness of the banking system relies critically on effective governance so that interest of all stakeholders, especially the depositors, are duly safeguarded. The essence of good governance is to build an environment of trust, transparency, and accountability. Depositors whose money represents an overwhelming part of banks' resources keep their life savings and hard-earned money with the banks. Protection of depositors' money is therefore a sacred duty which has to be fulfilled through good governance. There cannot be any compromise on this. The Reserve Bank is very particular that regulated entities have systems and processes that promote sound corporate governance. The assurance functions, that is risk management, compliance, and internal audits in banks are critical links between governance and business. Assurance functions assist the board as well as the senior management in gauging whether the business operations of the bank or NBFCs are being run in conformity with the policies and strategies laid down by the board. The Reserve Bank has issued detailed guidelines for ensuring quality and independence of the governance and assurance functions. These areas are also subjected to intensive supervisory assessment. Second, I talked about three pillars. This is the second one I'm touching upon now. We have devoted our efforts to identifying and addressing the root, cause, the root causes of vulnerabilities in banks and financial institutions. Many a times, vulnerabilities arise from inappropriate business models. I mentioned about it earlier. It comes from inappropriate business models adopted by banks and other financial entities. Over-aggressive growth strategies, mindless pursuit of bottom lines, for instance, are often precursor to future problems. While we do not interfere with the business decision making in any bank or any regulated entity, we emphasized that they must demonstrate adequacy of internal controls and loss absorption capacity to match the risks that their business models may generate. Our approach is to flag deficiencies in this area to the senior management or to the board of directors of individual banks for remedial action. Remedial action has to be taken by them. Our job as a regulator, as a supervisor, is to point out our discomfort, our concern on certain aspects of their business model, which may become a bigger risk, a bigger challenge, a bigger threat going forward. But the mitigation measure has to be taken by the management and the boards of banks. And it is our endeavor 
it is our priority to engage with the banks and financial institutions and ensure that necessary mitigation measures are taken and are taken in time. Our approach is to flag the deficiencies in this area, as I said, and leave it to the banks and also engage with them to ensure that remedial action is taken. We also remain engaged with external auditors and flag issues that are relevant for their role as the third line of defense. In recent times, our focus on root cause has led us to mandate certain housekeeping hygiene, such as automated identification of non-performing loans and provisioning, proper checks and balances in the use of internal and office accounts, implementation of early warning systems for preventing frauds, and a host of IT and cybersecurity related controls, among others. The third pillar of our approach is within the Reserve Bank, uh, is that within the Reserve Bank, we have considerably strengthened our supervisory analytics. We are increasingly employing data analytics, both macro and micro, to capture potential and emerging risks, identify outlier entities, and the vulnerable large exposure of the banks. Our on-site supervisors deep dive into areas red flagged by off-site supervision teams. We are also focusing on the adoption of advanced analytical-based technological solutions, including artificial intelligence and machine learning for strengthening the internal supervisory processes. We have a system of early warning signals that provide lead indications of risk buildup. Stress tests are also carried out on a continuous basis. These areas and these stress tests not only cover individual entities, but also capture the system level stress. While asset quality and capital position indicate resilience and robustness of financial institutions in the medium term, liquidity is often seen as the immediate cause of a crisis. We monitor liquidity positions of our entities very closely and aberrations, if any, are immediately taken up with the supervised entities for remedial measures. Thus, in our, thus our whole approach to supervision has been proactive for minimizing surprises, spotting concerns, and addressing vulnerabilities early. In essence, the unification of supervisory architecture within the Reserve Bank, that is by combining the supervisory processes of commercial banks, NBFCs, and urban cooperative banks into an integrated department of supervision. This is something which we did about three, four years ago. Earlier, we had a separate department for, as you would know, you know, department of, you know, there was a separate uh, department for banking supervision, separate for uh, NBFCs, separate for UCBs. Now we have combined them into a, uh, into a, you know, into a, uh, into a, what you call a integrated department of supervision. So in essence, the, uni uh, the unification of supervisory architecture within the Reserve Bank, ownership agnostic and risk focused supervision that we have adopted, a shift from episodic to continuous supervision, enhanced offsite surveillance, leveraging on data analytics and subtech solutions, strengthened on-site supervision, root cause analysis of problems and identification of outlier entities, and deep dive into vulnerable areas have been the major planks of our supervisory strategy. The Reserve Bank has also taken several regulatory initiatives in recent years to strengthen governance, risk management, audit and compliance functions in the non-banking financial companies, that is NBFCs and the urban cooperative banks. These include new scale-based regulatory framework for NBFCs, which was issued in October 2021, and the revised regulatory framework for urban cooperative banks, which was issued in July 2022. Even before these new regulatory frameworks were brought in, we had taken measures such as issuance of guidelines on appointment of chief risk officers and chief compliance officers in large NBFCs, 
We had taken measures also for liquidity coverage ratios for NBFCs with asset size of rupees 5,000 crore and above. We had also issued guidelines on risk-based internal audit norms for large NBFCs, again, with asset size of 5,000 crore and above, and also for urban, develop, urban cooperative banks with asset size of rupees 500 crore and above. We had also harmonized the guidelines on appointment of statutory auditors for in the non-banking financial companies and urban cooperative banks with that of the commercial banks. I would now like to touch upon the criticality of effective internal and external audits for financial institutions. It is no secret that stability and growth of an, eco of an economy and financial markets are dependent upon trust among the stakeholders. To be future ready, banks and financial institutions need to earn the trust of their current as well as prospective customers. One cannot take trust for granted. With greater openness of the economy and faster transmission of information and capital flows on account of advent of technology, it has become even more necessary to ensure credibility and confidence in the system. Towards this cause, a robust assurance mechanism by way of internal audit is essential to provide independent evaluation as, and assurance to the stakeholders that operations of the regulated entity are being performed in accordance with the prescribed policies and procedures. Statutory auditors also play a vital role in maintaining market confidence on audited financial statements. In banking industry, this public role is particularly relevant for financial stability, given that banks hold deposits. Audit quality is key to the effectiveness of such public role. For these reasons, the Reserve Bank, as the supervisor of banks, has taken key, keen interest in the functioning of statutory auditors of our regulated entities. Wherever and whenever necessary, we engage with the external statutory auditors on issues of critical nature on individual, in individual banks and financial entities. We have recently revised the guidelines for statutory branch audits of public sector banks, according to which a minimum of 70%, 70, 70 percent of credit exposure of a bank is required to be covered for a branch audit. From financial year 23-24 onwards, the board of directors of public sector banks will decide on the coverage of branch audit and selection of branches. Till now, we have been prescribing the percentages, but from the accounting year 23-24, the boards of individual banks are required to take decision on the coverage of, uh, they will decide on the coverage of branch audit and selection of individual branches, which will be taken up for audit. While doing so, the boards are required, and this we have prescribed the norms, while doing so, the boards are required to keep in mind the specific characteristics of individual banks, like the bank's business and risk profile, geographical spread, degree of centralization of processes, and similar other factors. We expect the boards of banks to exercise the highest level of diligence while deciding on these issues. As regards statutory branch audit of private sector banks, we are doing a fresh assessment of the quality and coverage of such audits. In the Reserve Bank, as I mentioned earlier, we attach a lot of importance to skill building and capacity development of our employees. We have been strengthening the Department of Supervision both in number and quality. This is important as effective supervision requires specialized skills and mature judgment. In this context, we expect the College of Supervisors to keep on improving its training methodologies, adopt more case study based teaching, have more practical sessions in its training programs, and develop objective assessment of the impact of its training interventions. And also, 
you know, keep on constantly innovating and I am sure the academic council of uh, the College of Supervisors and the entire management of College of Supervisors will, I am quite sure they will give uh, due emphasis to these aspects. Now the feedback received from the trainees may also be used to improve program content, content and fill the gaps identified. The training programs may also strike a balance between teaching hard technical skills and promoting soft skills such as leadership, decision making, time management and conflict resolution. The rapid developments and innovations in the financial system, especially in areas of fintech and digital products, pose new opportunities as well as risks. These may affect financial intermediation, payment systems, cybersecurity, and consumer protection. We have to continue monitoring and assessing the implications of these emerging trends while also developing our own capabilities and frameworks to effectively respond to these challenges. In recent times, we have seen a proliferation of digital lending by non-banking financial companies, fintechs and loan apps. Such lending also have brought with it certain challenges, especially with regard to fair practices and consumer protection. To address these challenges, the Reserve Bank has laid down comprehensive guidelines for digital lending in September 2022. These guidelines aim to ensure that lending activities are conducted by the regulated entities and their partners, such as loan service providers, in a prudent, fair, transparent, and responsible manner. Let me now conclude. To sum up, the Reserve Bank remains committed to future-proofing the Indian financial system and provide the required support for sustainable growth. I am confident that this global conference on financial resilience organized by the College of Supervisors with participation of experts from India and abroad will add considerable value to the body of knowledge in the area of resilient financial systems. I have been informed that many research papers on identified themes have been received and select papers have been made part of the maiden issue of the Journal of Financial Resilience, which was released today. I am sure the deliberations during the conference today and next two days would provide a lot of food for thought and bring new perspectives on the evolution of financial regulation and supervision. I wish the conference all success. Thank you very much.